The following program is made possible by the friends and partners of Time of Grace. In which continents did the events of the Bible take place? I'm a North American guy. I've lived most of my life here, done a little bit of traveling, but I'm a New World guy. And you know, when I read the Bible, not only did the Bible's events happen many millennia ago, time-wise far removed from us, but also geographically, they're halfway around the world. Most of the Bible's events took place in the Middle East and in parts of North Africa. However, there are a couple of stories where the gospel jumped across the borders and moved into Europe. And this is kind of interesting to me because that's where my ancestors are from. But Europe has played a powerful role in the history of the Christian church. And in my new series of Bible studies that I'm calling Mission Adventures, I would like to take a look with you at the way in which God took St. Paul out of his comfort zone in Asia. He's an Asian man and moved him to Europe to witness to a people not like him. I hope you enjoyed this story. Mission Adventures number three takes place today not far away from Sparta. In fact, it takes place right on top of the string that holds the two main halves of Greece together. It's like two big rocks connected by a string. The story today takes place on the string. And I want to invite you to open up your Bible to Acts chapter 18. You perhaps have read this before. Maybe you had trouble making sense out of it. Let's make some sense out of it. This is Paul's second missionary journey. Remember last week we studied how the gospel came to Europe. First time we know of explicitly it jumped out of Asia into Europe. He worked his way down from the shoulder up here, Philippi, to Macedonia, then down to Berea, then down to Athens. Now he's down on the string. Chapter 18 begins, Paul left Athens, went to Corinth. A Corinth. What an amazing city. Still there today. One of the few biblical cities still around, like Damascus and Rome and Athens. Its strategic location is so significant, even though it was utterly destroyed by the Romans in 146 B.C. It was rebuilt. And that's where Paul is now visiting. The ancient city is still there. You can see the ruins, although the modern builders used the old buildings as a quarry. They simply stole the stones. So there's not a whole lot left, but enough to see what a thriving place it was. At its peak, Corinth probably had a population of 200,000 freed men and women and probably half a million slaves lived in Corinth. The Greeks practiced slavery vigorously. Now, Paul goes to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila. Now, this is crazy. Get this. Aquila, he's, got the, he's a Jew with a Latin name. Aquila means the eagle, eagle boy. Native of Pontus, which is in northern Turkey, borders on the Black Sea, who had recently come from Italy because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Here's a Hebrew born in northern Asia Minor, lived in Rome, now he ends up in Corinth. You might think, oh man, back in the, back in the day nobody could travel, it was unsafe, you had to walk, everybody stayed real close to home, they were all real provincial, nobody got around very much, and it's all pure baloney. Those people, unbelievably, considering they had no cars and airplanes, really got around. And Aquila and his wife Priscilla must have kind of become Latinized. Although they're Jewish, they both have Latin names. Prisca is a man's name in Latin, and Pris Priscilla is the feminine form of it, like um, Nicholas and Nicole. Because Claudius, the emperor, 
had issued one of the first anti-Jewish pogroms or a holocaust. He, the Jews never liked being annexed in the Roman Empire and they were constantly agitating and troublesome. And Claudius said, get them out of Rome. I don't want those people here. They're, they're trouble. They're, they're inciting to riot, even in Rome. This highlights the time about 15 years later when there was a brief interruption in the Roman um, sequence of emperors. There was a lull when there was no emperor after the death of Nero. And in that, the lull is not a right word, there was an interregnum. There was a, a time when the succession was unclear. All allegiance had to be called back to Rome so a civil war wouldn't break out. And the Jews seized their chance in, six, in the year 67. It's only about a decade and a half after this and declared open revolt. And for three shining years, their province was independent before the Romans came back with a vengeance and smashed them to bits. So this was the first whiff that there was going to be trouble between the empire and the Jews. And Claudius said, I want get them out of Rome. Now, Paul heard about them, found them somehow in Corinth, went to see them because he was a tent maker as they were. Maybe they, he was working there part-time to support himself. His buddies, who would often work to provide money so they could eat, had not arrived yet. He had sent them up to Macedonia. So Paul, maybe as a boy in Tarsus, had learned the skill of working in canvas. What could be better, even more than tents? I think what they needed was sails for their ships. A canvas cloth worker, Repairing sails, making new sails, making the rigging you need to drive this commerce was big business in Corinth. I, I think of Corinth as kind of like the Chicago of the Mediterranean because it was a new city, it was bustling, it was big, it was aggressive, it was brash, not particularly cultured. Apologies to all of you from Illinois. I don't, I don't mean that in a nasty way, but they weren't the Athens. Uh, Ch Chicago is the Corinth of America ideally located for moving products throughout America. That's why Chicago's so big. It sits there right at the edge of the Great Lakes where the Great Plains connect with the Great Lakes. And that's why Chicago got so big. That's why Corinth got so big. But just like Chicago, Corinth was a wide open and often very immoral place. So up there on the Acro-Corinth was not only their castle, their fort, was also the temple of the patron goddess of the city. You know who that was, by any chance? This is a history trivia question. It's Aphrodite, unfortunately. The patron goddess of Athens was Athena, the goddess of wisdom. Uh, Sparta, the god of Sparta, was probably Mars, the god of war. Ares, the, god, the Greek god of war. But the, the patron goddess of Corinth was Aphrodite, goddess of love and fertility. There were uh, working in working in the temple on top of the Acro Corinth was a staff of a thousand priestesses who were also prostitutes. You could rent them, and this brought together three of people's favorite things: religion, sex, and money. All it was one-stop shopping. It, it was a huge business. That's the world Paul walked into. Now, he's, he meets Aquila and Priscilla. They're working with canvas. He worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. There were Greeks in the synagogue, too, who found in what they were hearing from the Hebrew Scriptures something vastly better than what they were hearing from the mythology. We call it mythology. They thought it were true stories uh, of the gods and goddesses of Greece. If you read those stories, the gods of Greece were simply superheroes, vain, jealous, angry, violent, liars, uh, adulterers, and had no love for the people on earth. They simply intervened when they felt like it in human affairs, impregnating whomever they wanted. They were, they were like divine rapists. They were like um, de deist, rapist, or something like that. It was just horrible, the stories that come out. And they were so busy fighting with each other, they tried to drag the earthlings into their conflicts. So what was there to look up to? They were just messed up human beings with superpowers. That's, that's supposedly as good as it got. What did you have to look forward to in the next life? Not much. 
the afterlife in the Greek mythology system meant either total extinction, you disappear completely, or a life of infinite boredom hanging out in the gray underworld where you're down in the caves for a bazillion years, or you'd get condemned to some kind of torture if you had managed to displease one of the gods. That's exciting. That's the best they had. The Jews in their scriptures gave them something more. So there was a Jewish core in that synagogue, but a whole collection of Greeks and probably some Romans too uh, who found this interesting. One of many reasons I think Paul uh, landed here to stay for a while is that not only were there Greeks and a fairly large Jewish population, but uh, Julius Caesar, when he rebuilt the city, made it one of his colonias, one of his military veteran settlement areas where he gave land as a retirement benefit to ex-legionnaires. So there was a big Latin-speaking component in Corinth as well. And some of those people had showed up. Now, Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia. Paul could now devote himself to exclusively to speaking, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. He kind of felt obligated to tell them first. That's why he always went to the synagogues first. When the Jews opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes like this. It's like a visual, like a visual aid for them. You know, like if you hear one of your friends utter a real blasphemy or some oath or something and you step away from them and say, oh man, I don't want to stand close to you in case you get hit by a lightning bolt. I don't want my clothes to be singed. Like I want, you know, like I want nothing to do with you. That's what you have chosen. That's what you want. Have at it. But I don't want to be associated with you. So he's like he's knocking the dust off his clothes. Your blood be on your own heads. I'm clear of my responsibility. I told you from now on I will go to the Gentiles. So next door, <laughs> I wish he could have gone a little farther, but next door he was invited in by his friend Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. The chairman of the congregation, the chairman of the synagogue, a lay leader named Crispus, and his entire household believed. Many of the Corinthians who heard him believed and were baptized. Now, when Paul was getting hassled, he usually decided it's time to move on and God didn't want him to move on. Whenever Paul needed extra persuasion and God needed him to stop doing what he was going to do and start doing what God wanted him to do, what would God do to him? Come to him in a dream. And I, as I told you last week, when he got the dream to go to Macedonia, I think it's because we fight less against implausible things in our sleep. There's no limit to what you will dream about, right? You have the most weird, fantastic dreams where anything goes. I think when, when God needed to persuade a young man not to be afraid to marry a woman and that uh, the baby growing inside of her, she was already a mother and it wasn't Joseph's doing, uh, God had to jump Joseph in his sleep because he would have never believed it if he'd have been awake. And you, you all, you guys out there probably wouldn't have either. It was the, one of the hardest burdens any man ever had to bear, knowing that his fiance was carrying a baby that he was not the father of. That's a hard, hard load to carry. And so God snuck up on Joseph in his sleep and eased the idea into his being. That's how God got Paul out of Asia into Europe. Now he wants him to stay, which breaks his MO because usually Paul, like Johnny Appleseed, was a planter. Now he needs to sit tight. This, this is very unusual. He only did it twice that I know of. Ephesus was the other one. Here's the vision. Don't be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. I am with you. No one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. So he stayed for a year and a half teaching them the word of God. I'm going to come back to that in a minute, but let's just finish the story because that's the main thing right there. We're going to come back to that. While Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, boy, there's a bunch of old kind of words. Achaia is the name of the Roman province for, for Greece proper, the arm and the, the rock on the string. Gallio was the brother of the Roman philosopher Seneca, who ironically was the tutor of the killer Nero, who was going to order Paul's execution. Gallio was the proconsul as a governor representing the Roman government, made a united 
the Jews made a united attack on Paul, brought him into court. Now, he would have left, but God said stay, so he had to stay. This man, they said, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Well, their law, maybe, but not Greek law. So Gallio said to the Jews, if you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, settle the matter yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. And he had him ejected from the court. Bailiff, get these guys out of here. Court, to, uh, court, ad- court adjourned, let's go to lunch. And they all turned uh, on Sosthenes, the new synagogue ruler, and beat him in front of the court. But Gallio showed no concern, whatever. Now, what, what is that? What is this beating? They didn't beat Paul, they beat Sosthenes. There's a number of different ways to understand what, what just happened here. And in view of the shortness of time, I know, I know. In view of the shortness of time, I'll cut to the chase of what I think is the most likely explanation. Are you okay with that? If, we, if I skip alternatives one and two? <laughs> All right. There's a clue. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Sosthenes extends greetings as a Christian believer. I think in the, since he got the job replacing Crispus, he started getting into this Jesus message too. And he did not prosecute the case for the synagogue as vigorously as the mob wanted. I think they turned on him. This was the same mob that had threatened Paul. Other mobs had beaten Paul in Asia Minor to an inch of his life. That's what I think happened, that he became a Christian himself and that beating only confirmed the fact that he had no future in the synagogue and that the Christian church was the place for him. Uh, so what? This is a, a kind of one of my geography and history rants. Uh, it'll get better soon. Uh, don't, don't worry about it. I'm not going to always be like this. But you might think, oh, that was all kind of interesting, uh, strange tales of long ago. But so what? What does this have to do with me right now? It has everything to do with you. Because the same, the storylines that you are witnessing here are still going on. First, you can expect Satan to make your life as a Christian harder, not easier. He doesn't roll over and give up just because you're safe in the arms of Jesus now. In some ways, your life will get easier. In some ways, your life will get harder. You may experience hardship and persecution even from within the Christian church. People you thought might have been your support crew, your posse, turn on you. And unfortunately, they're is great disloyalty and cruelty of Christian on Christian. I wish it were not so, but I'd be lying to you if I told you it's going to be sweet, easy sailing from here on in. You will sail into headwinds in your little boat, sometimes from attacks from outside the church, but sometimes you will get hurt from people within. Look at what God said to Paul. He said, I got a plan and I have protection. And you are bulletproof until you have fulfilled your plan. This might, you might read, for instance, Psalm 91 that says, I will send my angels to keep watch over you so that you won't even stub your toe on a rock. And you might say, I've buried people who are Christians. I've been at their graveside when they died young. God, how can you say that? that that's a complete misunderstanding of the psalm. Everybody is going to die sooner or later. We, we all are headed for the grave. But you cannot die one minute sooner than God allows until your personal planned mission has been accomplished. And God said to Paul, don't be afraid. He was going to die a martyr, but not yet. There's a plan, there's protection, and God's going to prosper it. I have many people in this city. God sees where his opportunities lie, where there is openness That's why he does not view things like Aquila and Priscilla being driven out of Rome as a disaster. They might have said, oh man, we're refugees again. We've been, all us Jews have been hounded out of Rome. God said, hey, I don't see you as refugees. I see you as I see you as missionaries. God loves 
the churning and moving of peoples. It drives pastors crazy because we get somebody tuned up and you know functioning in ministry and then they move to L.A. or Phoenix or Boston or something. God thinks, how cool. He's moving things around. He's looking for opportunities. And not everybody and not every group is always open at the same time. And God wants to connect message with opportunity. Christ himself did not bet 1,000% in his evangelism, did he? But he went where there was opportunity and where people would listen. God could see that the Greeks in Corinth had great openness of spirit, maybe more so than the more conservative old-line Athenians. Athens in the early church was not a, a great, strong place. Corinth became one of the biggest congregations. And Paul wrote two letters to this booming congregation, uh, which we cherish in our scripture as Corinthians. So God has plans, God has protection, and God prospers his message. And let me give you that encouragement in your life. You can't die a minute sooner than God has need of you. That takes all the fear, all the pressure off of you. You can enjoy your life right now knowing that you're part of a plan, you're part of a mission to share good news, to help people enjoy their lives, to know they're beautifully designed by a master engineer and architect. That they can live lives without guilt and without fear, knowing you have a purpose to be here. You can live without fearing your death because you know you're immortal and death is nothing but a doorway that you pass through to a life that's even better than the one you have now. In fact, way better. That means you and I are God's agents like Paul and he has a use for you right where you are and only you can function in your mission. Only you have influence to that particular group of people around you and only you are functioning in that geographic area, where you work, where you live, who you know. And so here's my encouragement to you. Don't run away. Be dangerous for the Lord Jesus. Be on your own mission adventure and share good news of forgiveness in Christ and immortality in Christ. This is good news for God's people. Say amen. amen. Here's a question from a viewer that you might find interesting. This person writes, when someone doesn't want you to write or speak to him or her about Jesus, should you stay away from that person? Well, there's a short and a long answer to that. The short answer is no, don't stay away. Christians have not done well when they shun other people. And people who don't agree with you or they're living a lifestyle that we know the Bible does not approve of, people doing things that we know God would not approve of, Shunning them does not help change anything. As God has loved us unconditionally, he still wants us to love other people without conditions and reservations. That doesn't mean that you approve of the way they treat you, but you never stop loving them. And shunning and pushing them away even means they'll have that much less contact with a Christian and with the Word of God. So put, pushing them away, staying away from them, no. Now, but what do you do, though, if someone says he or she does not want to talk about faith matters? What you can do is you can earn the right to talk about them. That person may be pushing you away when your relationship is, is new or recent or kind of fragile or isn't built on much. But when you have demonstrated that you love that person unconditionally, when you have done things to serve that person and help that person, you have earned the right to tell the truth about your Savior Jesus. You don't have to go on and on and on about it, but you can say, I know that this is an uncomfortable topic for you, but I have something to say. I want to tell you that I know that you have guilt inside your heart, but I want you to know that your Savior Jesus loves you as is, and he has given his life so that you could be forgiven and so that you could be immortal. Those promises are for all who believe it. I'll be back to pray with you in just a moment. Enjoy a daily devotion from Pastor Mark Jeske each day in April through June when you request a copy of our new Grace Moments booklet. 
Each devotion will bring you a word from your Creator, your Savior, your Counselor, as you dig into God's Word and grow in your relationship with Jesus. This booklet is available for your best gift. Call or visit the Time of Grace web store today to request a copy. The reason that you and I can be having this conversation today is because of the miracles of mass media, but also because of the generosity of the friends of Time of Grace. We receive no corporate or um, some institutional or foundational support for this program. It is completely funded by the gifts that come from our viewers and our readers. And I want to say thank you to all of you. I truly do consider you to be my partners in ministry. If you have not recently given your own personal financial gift to Time of Grace, let me ask you and invite you today to pray and consider your best gift so that your voice and strength can be added to mine and we can make good news of Jesus go far and wide in this country and throughout the world. Can I pray with you today? Let's pray for the continued success of the gospel to move out of our comfort zones and move in places where it needs to go. Dear Lord, you have been doing a wonderful thing for many, many centuries, for millennia. You have been taking people and moving them from one place to another in order to move your message from one place to another. You love to use the movement of people from the known to the unknown, from the familiar to the strange, from the near to the far, in order to share good news of your plans of salvation. We are amazed at what you accomplished through people like St. Paul, and we pray that you will continue to be amazed that the work that you were doing once will continue even today. Use Christians to go from where they are safe and known to the unknown, Help us to spread the word to people not like us. Help it so that there is nowhere on the globe where the gospel message of Jesus is not being heard. And help us to grow our courage as you changed and emboldened St. Paul. Help us in that same way to allow you to use us to bring the word where it had not been before. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For Time of Grace, I'm Pastor Mark Jeske, assuring you every day is a day of God's amazing grace for you. Helping you reach the next level of your Christian life is a driving passion for Mark Jeske and the ministry team at Time of Grace. When you visit timeofgrace.org, you'll find more resources than ever, including video extras, social media connections, new products, plus our prayer ministry, all at timeofgrace.org and pray about becoming a Grace Partner, an exclusive group of partners and donors who are committed to help us expand Mark Jeske's teaching ministry around the world. Just call 1-800-661-3311 or visit us at timeofgrace.org. Thanks for watching and join us again next time for Mark Jeske and Time of Grace. The preceding program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Time of Grace.